Okay, at number 10, we have Pain Resistance. Moon Knight, or Mark Spector, has been through a lot over the years, and it's fair to say that he may be the living reminder that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I know what you're thinking off the top. That isn't really a power. Well, a lot of Moon Knight's powers are like this, since Khonshu comes in and out of the stories as a powerful muse for Mark Spector. Some say this is because he was Marvel's response to Batman's success, basically Marvel's Batman, and we all know that Batman is sort of the same way. A guy who doesn't really have any special powers other than what his mortal identity brings to the table. One good example of Moon Knight's pain resistance is in the first run for the character when he crawls through Bora's icy wind despite the extreme pain. Something that even Professor X confirms is causing him so much agony that he can't even fathom this ability. It could be argued that his tolerance to pain could be due to him having died and come back to life, giving him a tougher disposition by way of Khonshu's blessing. Or he's just a badass like that. Okay, at number 9, we've got Weapon Mastery. If you follow Moon Knight's story in the comics, you'll know that his work in the CIA has him training with all sorts of weaponry like batons, brass knuckles, chains, shurikens, as well as guns like pistols, sniper rifles, submachine guns, and grenade launchers, among many others. His background in the CIA and Marines have arguably a more substantial effect on his power set than the event with Khonshu's ghost, which is a pretty cool way for a character to find their power set, if you ask me. At number 8, we have Moon Knight's Super Speed. This is a power that often isn't cited as one of the character's main abilities, but it is something he flaunts again and again. In a few instances, he actually dodges bullets one time from a number of different automatic turrets firing at him all at once. This is a pretty crazy display of not only speed, but dexterity, being able to move his body like this and doing it while he's flying through the air. In another instance, he actually dodges fire from a lightning spear while he's crammed into a tiny aircraft. And another time when he actually catches a dart fired from a crossbow with ease. This ability comes in hugely handy for this guy because I'm not sure that his speed even relies on the power of the moon. He's just like this. At number seven, we've got Immortality. This is one that many people wouldn't necessarily attribute to Moon Knight because Mark himself has actually died a handful of times. But it seems as though every time this happens, Khonshu is able to revive him without issue. The best demonstration of his tendency to be brought back from the dead is near the end of Moon Knight Volume 3 when he dies. Twice. The first time it seems that he's stabbed and takes a huge fall, but then he's brought back from the depths of the ocean. And the second time he dies right at the end of the storyline, but in the following run comes back again, emerging, or rather exploding, out of Khonshu's tomb. So he's not immortal per se, but he doesn't seem to be capable of being dead for very long before his ancient muse is able to give him another go at life. At number six is what's known as Luna Kinesis. This entry and most of what's coming up for the rest of the list is during a time when Mark is influenced by Khonshu's powers. So he gets some pretty huge power boosts. Luna Kinesis is basically the ability to control the different moons in the universe, as well as any objects made out of the moon's materials. This is what actually allows him to take control of Mjolnir in Avengers number 33, which we'll explore more later on in the list. This power is super useful considering for this time he is able to call upon the energy of the moon to imbue him with a plethora of extremely useful abilities. Another power that goes along with this is known as geokinesis, which is pretty much the ability to manipulate any minerals, rock, and dead terra firma that would make up the structure of a moon, or anything considered to be a moon in the universe. So if your planet's moon is made up of mostly titanium, for example, he's going to be able to manipulate titanium by sheer will. Pretty nuts. All right, at number five, we've got the time that Mark Spector is empowered by Phoenix Force while he's facing off against the Avengers and his former master, Khonshu. We all know that the Phoenix Force is one of the most powerful deities in the universe, and it has been used most notably to possess living beings as hosts. But considering how powerful Mark gets when he's taken over by Khonshu, one can only imagine how much of a boost he gets when Phoenix Force is brought into the mix. Actually, one doesn't have to imagine, because in Avengers number 37, we witness Moon Knight taking on Phoenix Force and harnessing the most power he's ever had in his life. 
He gets so powerful at this point that he just sort of dismisses Khonshu, showing that he doesn't need the Moon God anymore due to his immense power from Phoenix Force and a few of the Avengers as well. But that's coming up at the top of our list, so stay tuned. At number four, we've got Moon Knight's ability for self-sustenance. Maybe this is one that you already know, but it's another power that often isn't associated with Moon Knight's typical power set. While he's imbued with Khonshu's power, Mark Spector is actually able to live in any atmosphere without needing oxygen. This allows him to travel into the cosmos without the need for a breathing mask or a ship with a pressurized cabin. He makes use of this power when he travels to the moon to encounter Thor in a pivotal moment in Moon Knight's trajectory as a character. It's an ability that is widely underrated for this character but allows him to reach his full potential when he faces off against the Avengers mentioned previously on this list. At number 3 is Moon Knight's Telepathic Resistance. This is a great ability and it's actually attributed to the character's struggle with mental illness and more specifically his multiple personality disorder. This is clear in West Coast Avengers Volume 2 issues 30 and 36 when Moon Knight is working with the Avengers and notices that he's the only one whose mind hasn't been taken control of. He attributes it to the fact that he's grown strong over the years dealing with his own struggles with mental intrusions from the Moon God Khonshu. He even notices that Vision's mind has been taken over, and for an android to have his mind taken over, it just proves how strong Moon Knight's mind defense has become. Mind defense. Is that a good way of putting it? Anyway, you know what I mean. But considering he's got an, a number of other voices always speaking to him from within, he seems to have enough going on up there that his true mind, his reasonable mind, stays intact when mind control is tried on him. Alright, at number two is Moon Knight's formidable martial arts skills. I never use the word formidable, but I'm going to use it now because the range of his fighting ability is just formidable. And I know we all know that Moon Knight can fight, that's obvious. But many people don't realize that it's one of his most notable and important powers. Because sometimes he can't rely on the power of the moon or Khonshu's influence to get the job done. And he needs to go back to his roots as a trained CIA fighter. Did you know that Mark Spector, without even being under the influence of Khonshu, knows Muay Thai, Kung Fu, Eskrima, Krav Maga, Dambe, Savate, Boxing, Silat, Filipino Martial Arts, Judo, Karate, and Ninjutsu. But what's most impressive is how he employs these techniques throughout his different runs in the comics. His training in martial arts is even arguably all that keeps him alive in tough times, like when he's badly injured in the pre-Vengeance storyline rendering him weaker and slower than ever before. Probably the best place to look for his wide array of fighting abilities will be in the current run, first published in 2021 and being released as we speak. In this modern publication, Moon Knight is back to being brutal and when not pulling his punches when facing off against his enemies. Moon Knight is back to being brutal and really not pulling his punches when facing off against his enemies. Okay, at number one is power absorption. This ability allows him to steal powers from other extremely powerful superheroes in a few different instances. In Avengers number 33, Moon Knight is on a tear, taking on a number of Avengers with an army of undead on his back. He starts off by taking the immortal Iron Fist's powers and encapsulating them in an Ankh that he wears around his neck. Then he travels to the Sanctum Sanctorum to steal Doctor Strange's powers, also storing it in the Ankh necklace. He tries this again with the Black Panther, but is unsuccessful. Not beaten, just unsuccessful in taking his powers away. So then he runs into Thor on the moon, which we mentioned earlier, and uh-oh, not a great place to run into the agent of Khonshu. Basically, he steals Mjolnir from Thor, which shows that this guy can basically render the Avengers useless, at least as long as they're apart. It's a pretty crazy feat for Moon Knight and shows off a power that some may not know he possesses. And at number 10, Moon-Based Powers. Moon Knight, similar to Batman, is a rich dude with a whole lot of training and willpower. But unlike the Cape Crusader, when Moon Knight first hit the scene, he actually had superpowers. The character has been susceptible to a lot of changes over the years thanks to new creative teams taking on his solo title, which explains these changes. For example, in 1985, in a six-part miniseries, Moon Knight became known as the Fist of Khonshu, Khonshu being the ancient Egyptian god of the moon. 
and vengeance. This increased his strength, speed, and endurance, but was based on the lunar cycle, meaning that the fuller the moon was, the stronger Moon Knight became, capable of lifting several hundred pounds. This is where things got a little messy though. He was last seen using these lunar powers while on the West Coast Avengers team, a team that he left in 1989. But it wasn't until 2007 in the Midnight Sun story arc that he was confirmed to no longer have those powers. Apparently, they were taken away from him as a punishment for his disobedience. Up next, number nine, he is resistant to psychic attacks. Mark Spector has proven to have immunity to psychic attacks over the years. Now, this is largely owed to his multiple personalities, and he's been known in the past to even receive prophetic visions. In addition to that, in Moon Knight issue 12, Moon Knight finds himself going up against the Profile, who is an unethical profiler for hire who is believed to have mutant abilities that allow him to analyze and predict the actions of anyone he observes. Scary, right? But that did not bother Moon Knight. Profiler claimed that his abilities had no effect on Moon Knight, with him being physically painful for the antagonist to look at. His abilities don't work on those with supernatural powers, yet Moon Knight at the time did not have powers. Profiler believes that the only explanation for this is that Khonshu is actually real or that Mark was so insane that his belief in the Egyptian god is tantamount to magic and therefore disrupts Profiler's abilities. Moving on to number 8 is mercenary skills. Before becoming a superhero, Mark Spector was a mercenary for hire employed by the CIA. And prior to that, he was a heavyweight boxer before becoming a US Marine. After his time in the military, he jumped over to mercenary work with the CIA hiring him as a freelancer of sorts. But after a botched mission in Egypt, he ended up being beaten to near death by a peer named Raoul Bushman, who would later be a major villain for him. He was left to die in the sub-zero temperatures of the Egyptian desert at night. He is then found by Egyptians who worship the ancient gods, brought to Khonshu's temple and his heart stops altogether. He then sees a vision of the god who offers him a second chance if he becomes the god's avatar on earth. Spectre agrees, wakes up and then goes after Bushman and becomes Moon Knight. Now, Because of his previous training, he also has Olympic level athlete skills and is an expert in fighting styles likes of karate, ninjutsu, judo, muay thai, boxing, kung fu and more. He also knows how to pilot the hell out of an aircraft too. Up next at 7, Werewolf Hunter. In Moon Knight's very first comic book appearance, he was brought in as a werewolf hunter and a supernatural expert of sorts. And he was actually a villain, attempting to capture werewolf by night Jack Russell in a two part story for the committee, which is an LA based secret criminal cabal of businessmen who would later become an opponent of Moon Knight's. Now that's because Spectre learns that the committee is trying to use him as a weapon, so he ends up helping werewolf escape and fights alongside him. Weirdly enough, a handful of issues later in Werewolf at Night issue 37, Moon Knight returned but as a demonic apparition that fought against werewolf, so that's fun. And at 6, visibility. Ok, so this really isn't a power, but it is a technique that Spectre employs that helps him be more intimidating and to throw his opponents off. Now unlike the DC vigilante he is constantly compared to, Mark actually wears a full white costume so that he can be seen. He wants to be seen. This was something that was addressed on Warren Ellis's 2014 run on the character's solo title. Moon Knight chooses to wear white because he doesn't have any interest in using stealth techniques. Like I said, he wants to be seen. It's his brand of fear. In at number 5, he has 10 different personalities. Mark Spector has Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's one of his most defining traits in the comics. Now, Over the years though, some of the creative teams who have worked on Moon Knight have attempted to retcon his mental illness as being part of Khonshu's personality. Regardless, we've seen at least 10 unique personalities emerge from Spector in the comics, which include the wealthy businessman Stephen Grant, a cab driver named Jake Lockley who has an uncanny ability of gaining street intel on criminals and their activities. Activities, and even a personality known as Mr. Knight, an official detective for the NYPD while he operated as the vigilante Moon Knight at night. Even more interestingly, during the 2011 Moon Knight series, Mark manifests personalities for that iteration of the Avengers at the time. One for Wolverine, Captain America, Spider-Man, Iron Man and Echo, all of which gave him advice and he ends up using variations of their signature weapons and moves. So how is this a power? Well, it's more so a shifting of perspectives that have aided Spectre in one way or another over the years with each of these personalities unique skill sets. It's also been a coping mechanism. Stephen Grant was largely created in order to help Mark subconsciously deal with his very violent past. Moving on to number 4, his tech. Moon Knight has a whole lot of expensive and effective gear. He uses some impressive tech that rivals what DC's Batman has been known to bust out. He's also rich, which helps. <laughs> He's got an advanced truncheon that can split into two separate combat clubs and can also be tethered together like nunchucks. And he has an adamantium grappling hook, crescent darts that are kind of like this hero's version of batarangs, and of course his coolest piece of tech by far, the mooncopter. This bad boy is a sophisticated hovering aircraft that has vertical takeoff and landing abilities, 20mm cannons, 
stealth and combat equipment, and much, much more. Plus, he's got a remote controlled crescent shaped glider and a remote controlled limousine. He's owned suits made out of adamantium, and during the Dark Rain story event, he gets the Tinkerer to upgrade his gear, giving him a suit of armor that is made out of carbonandium. It also has joint locking functions, which allows him to support a whole lot of extra weight than what's humanly possible, especially now that he doesn't have superhuman strength. Speaking of tech, that brings us to our next number. In at three, the Shadow Cabinet. Now, the Shadow Cabinet is something that Mark Spector assembled as a network of informants and agents whose advice he often requires. It's essentially a sophisticated computer network. Now, for the most part, many of those agents were unaware of who they were actually speaking to, having been recruited anonymously with promise of financial payment or with the use of blackmail, deception, trading favors, or just flat out due to the kindness of their hearts. Now, this cabinet is a piece of tech that uses hollow projection rings with one way communicators that lets Mark see those that he is speaking to, but only lets them hear his voice on the other end. Mark would first use it in Mark Spectre Moon Knight issue 38 in 1992 when he attempted to track the movements of his serial killer brother, Randall Spectre. In at two, his durability. Spectre has an almost superhuman tolerance for pain. He uses a very specific fighting style, which consists of him enduring any blows that he takes in battle. In the 2006 run on Moon Knight, we saw the title character go up against villain Taskmaster, who has the ability to mimic the fighting style of any individual. Except he will not mimic Moon Knights. That's because Mark never blocks incoming attacks. As he puts it, it's never about speed or slick moves or reflexes that make you the best fighter ever. It's all about what you can take. Now, because of this, he's got a crazy high pain tolerance, making him almost superhuman in durability. Taskmaster shot him in the shoulder with a crossbow and it barely affected Mark. But when you consider another skill of his that's in at our next number, taking this many hits is no biggie. That brings us to our number one spot. Resurrection. Moon Knight has died and then been resurrected on several occasions, including in his origin story. As we mentioned, his heart stopped, and that's when he encountered Khonshu for the first time after he was essentially killed by Raoul Bushman. Then, in Mark Spector Moon Knight issue 28, he was literally stabbed in the back, and his soul drifted out of his body. Khonshu revived him. And it kept happening thanks to that Egyptian moon god. Mark in the same series would receive another fatal injury, this time thanks to an explosion caused by Mark quarantining himself with a computer virus. That was rather deadly. So in other words, he can handle being dealt fatal blows since you know he's got a free get out of death card in the form of Khonshu saving his butt all the time. Number 10. He died. He got his powers while working as a mercenary for hire for a man named Raoul Bushman, who was looking for an Egyptian tomb. Bushman was a ruthless sort, enjoying the violence he brought to others and killing people to try and find what he wanted. Mark did not enjoy this side of Bushman and punched Bushman after he killed the archaeologist on the expedition, Peter Alron, in an attempt to protect Peter's daughter, Marlene. During this fight, Bushman ended up getting the upper hand and left him for dead. Fortunately, he was able to make his way back to the tomb before he went unconscious. Marlene and the rest of the exploration team carried his body into the tomb and laid him out below an idol belonging to an Egyptian god, Khonshu. Mark had a vision involving Khonshu, who promised him life in exchange for his loyalty to the god and commitment to do Khonshu's bidding. Mark accepted. Later, Spectre would ponder that he had simply been having near-death hallucinations. Ooh, spooky. Number 9. Military Service Before he was Moon Knight, Mark Spector served in the military as a marine, and even went to Iraq. Well, you might not think this is scary, war is actually terrifying. To add to this intensity of his service, he also began having episodes while on tour. Mark actually suffers from disassociative personality disorder, but we'll touch more on that later. He at one point is shown in the comics coming to after seeming to have wandered outside of the military camp, following a voice that called to him in the dark under the full moon. Not only is this in and of itself terrifying, as it could have compromised his fellow soldiers' safety, but concern is expressed by those who leave the camp to find him when they tell him he has actually walked into a minefield. Boom. Number eight, Ole Uncle Nazi. Yitz Perlman was a close family friend and rabbi who had fled Germany with Spectre's family. Oh yeah, Mark is also Jewish. But it is later revealed in a flashback in the comics that Yitz Perlman, who has been a family friend of the Spectre since Elias, Mark's father, was just a kid, is actually not who he appears to be. Mark ends up in an area of the synagogue he is not meant to be in and falls down through a trap door leading into the basement, further into the basement. He was meant to meet Yitz, who he fondly refers to his uncle Yitz later in the evening. Yitz is also down in this basement in the dark, and upon Mark stumbling in, decides to reveal his true identity. He lights a match to reveal a bloody corpse hanging from the ceiling and offers Mark the prompt, a rabbi, a Nazi, and a serial killer walk into a bar. Yitz Perlman was actually the adopted identity that allowed Ernst, the man's real name, to escape Germany as Hitler's reign was coming to an end, and avoid prosecution as a Nazi. And as he suggests, he is also a serial killer. This revelation would scar Mark for the rest 
rest of his life. And leads into our next scary fact. Number 7 Multiple Personalities The traumatic revelation of finding out that his uncle Yitz was actually a Nazi and serial killer ended up traumatizing Mark to the point that he developed a dissociative personality disorder. Which I mean is fair. If I found out that my uncle was a Nazi and a serial killer, I probably would want to take a break from being myself too. For those who don't know, dissociative personality disorder, also sometimes referred to as dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder, is a condition where the afflicted alternates between at least two different personality states. The condition is also usually accompanied by blackouts and gaps in one's memory, meaning you can adopt another personality and go about your life in that separate identity or state and then potentially forget what you were doing or have done. Pretty spooky stuff. And Mark doesn't just have two alternate personalities, no, he is a revolving door of 10 personalities, including Jake Lockley, cab driver, and Stephen Grant, millionaire. The fact that he is also capable of transitioning between them so quickly also makes it hard for him to settle down in life. Number six. He has a kid. While admittedly having children isn't very scary, having a child while also suffering severely from disassociative identity disorder can be. I also think the premise of having a child and being fully responsible for a life is objectively terrifying, but that's just me. Remember Marlene from the Egyptian expedition gone wrong that strengthened his bond to Khonshu? Her and Mark have an on and off again romance in the comics, kind of to be expected considering their shared trauma. While the two have never quite been able to make it stick due to the fact that Mark's crime fighting persona Moon Knight means putting Marlene constantly in danger, and the fact that he is constantly jumping from one of his personalities to the next, there is a time when they actually manage to settle down for a while. During this time the two conceived a child and Marlene gave birth to a daughter who is named Diatrice in the comics. Diatrice Alron, she took her mother's last name. The really odd and scary thing is that she's not really fully Mark's daughter. At the time that they settled down, Mark was living as his personality Jake Lockley, and it was because he settled into this personality for such a lengthy period that he and Marlene were even able to to make the relationship work. So is Diatrice really even Mark's daughter? I don't know. Sounds like she's more Jake's daughter I guess. Number 5 Khonshu You might not think the Egyptian god of the moon Khonshu is a particularly frightening figure, especially since Khonshu is the one granting Mark his powers. But is he? Later in the comics it is revealed that Khonshu seeks to drive Mark insane so that he can use his body as a vessel to enter the realm of the living. While this ends up being untrue, what is implied instead is even more terrifying. It is implied that Khonshu is simply an illusion that was created to help cure Mark. Ultimately, he recognizes that in order to gain control of himself and his personalities, he must accept them. In doing so, he gains control again and regains his sanity. One of those, ooh, it was all a dream type scenarios. Number 4 Morpheus No, not that Morpheus. We are instead talking about one of Moon Knight's villains, Robert Markham. To really understand the darker side of this character, it's good to get into the mind of those he fights and also the way Mark grapples with his demons. Not just his internal demons either. Robert Markham was suffering from a rare viral disease and sought help. From there he became a patient of Peter Alrun Jr, brother of Marlene Alrun and son of the original Peter Alrun. Sorry if I'm saying this last name really really wrong. <laughs> My apologies. The experimental drug that Peter Jr prescribes leads to Robert being unable to sleep and developing psionic abilities. Oh, and he also becomes a boogeyman monster looking type with like claw hands. It's creepy. He ends up being thwarted by Moon Knight the first time but returns to his villainous ways after mutating even further, allowing himself to link his mind with Peter Jr's and use it to project nightmares into other people's minds. Hence his name Morpheus, which is actually adopted from Greek mythology where Morpheus is known as the god of dreams. Not from the Matrix unfortunately, in case you thought that was where I was going. But oddly enough, the same source that the writers for the Matrix probably were inspired by for their character of the same name. Number 3 Addiction Like most heroes, he has also suffered from an addiction. His is one that is actually also a huge global issue in the real world currently, an addiction to painkillers. This happened as a result of a battle between him and Bush that left him crippled with two broken knees. Obviously needing the medication while healing, he ended up developing an addiction to them. Like Mark doesn't have enough issues to worry about. He sees things, has illusions, was friends with a Nazi, and wrestles with multiple personalities, and fights crime on top of that. And then he also has to wrestle with an addiction? Oh, talk about a rough go. Number 2 His brother is a serial killer Everywhere you look with Moon Knight there are just serial killers everywhere. And you definitely don't have to look far for this one. Randall Spector is Mark Spector's brother, who after betraying him by killing his girlfriend and getting blown up by Mark with a grenade, became a serial killer of nurses. Oddly specific. He currently knows, goes by the name Shadow Knight and his costume and look is also quite terrifying as well. Definitely not someone you'd want to meet in a dark alley. He is part of the cult of Khonshu and was granted superhuman strength and durability 
by Princess Nephthys, who was also once his lover. Number one, brutality. Bushman has obviously been one of Mark's greatest foes throughout the comics, and as a result of such, their fights have been legendary. These fights have also gone to show just how different Mark Spector really is from DC's Batman. Batman can be brutal too, sure, but there's Batman level brutal, and then there's Moon Knight's level of brutal. For an example of just how violent Moon Knight can be, and as an example of how he really sees himself as the one doling out justice, I point you to Moon Knight Volume 5, Issue 2. This is also the fight where Moon Knight shatters both his knees, but even while down, he keeps on fighting. And gruesomely too, he manages to cut off Bushman's face using the blade on his crescent moon dart. I don't think I've ever seen Batman quite do that. Number 10, The Dark Knight. So while many have horrifyingly dismissed Mark as just another Batman ripoff, we're here to calmly assure you it's just not so. While there are a good number of similarities that can be pointed to in regards to the heroes, never fear, Top 10 Nerd is here to point out the prominent differences. Batman fights for justice, so he never kills, whereas Moon Knight fights for Khonshu and was a former mercenary, who has no problem whatsoever with killing his enemies. Beyond that, their motivations are completely different. Batman is driven by his guilt and the death of his parents, Mark is driven by his almost contractual obligation to Khonshu. His path as a hero is less direct and takes him all over the place. Then there is the easy one, see if you can spot it. Batman wears all black, Moon Knight wears all white. Batman hides in the shadows. Moon Knight wants his enemies to see him coming. That's why he wears white. I'm not making that up either. That's straight out of the comics. Number nine, not so ancient weapons. Well, his weapons come from the ancient Egyptian tomb where he was laid to rest beneath Khonshu's idol and received his powers. They are not as old as they seem. Well, they sort of are, but they also aren't. His weapons are actually surprisingly modern. While this may not seem scary to you, this story involves some timey wimey time travel stuff, and time travel can be pretty terrifying as it can mess up you and your life's trajectory. Hardcore. To me, the idea of that is pretty scary. In a West Coast Avengers storyline, the team gets flung thousands of years into the past and ends up in ancient Egypt. Hawkeye fashions weapons to help the priests of Khonshu defend themselves, and it is these weapons that end up in the tomb where Moon Knight later receives his powers. So yeah, he wouldn't really be himself if not for time travel and Hawkeye and the West Coast Avengers. And oddly enough, Moon Knight also becomes a West Coast Avenger. Weirdly cyclical storytelling, making me wonder if the Marvel Universe is actually stuck in some kind of time loop. Hmm. Number 8. Bushman was resurrected. So if you've watched my part 1, you know that Mark skinned Bushman's face off and left him for dead after breaking both of his own knees in their epic fight. But did you know that Bushman was later resurrected? Yep, that's right. You thought resurrection was just safe for Khonshu, cause it's not. Moon Knight goes up against Bushman again after he is resurrected by the Hood. The Hood resurrected Bushman when tasked by Norman Osborn with getting rid of Moon Knight. During the events of the Vengeance of the Moon Knight series, a tussle eventually ensues between Moon Knight and his number one enemy Bushman. Mark gets the upper hand and impales Bushman with a machine gun. He actually goes to cut off his face again, but decides against it in the end. Whew. Number 7, Member of the Avengers. That's right, Moon Knight was even Steve Rogers approved to join up. Even after he terrified Beast after having an indifferent, some would say even jovial reaction to being shot in the leg. Despite the fact that he often claims that he is a loner, Mark has actually been a part of multiple Avengers teams, including the West Coast Avengers. Many other heroes have feared working alongside him simply because they worry about his mental instability and how it will affect him while on missions. Granted, so far he has managed to behave pretty well while on teams and rain in his other personalities when he needs to. Number 6. He fights ghosts. You heard me right. The cool thing about Moon Knight is because he has so many different personas, he is actually a very versatile hero and character. He can fit in almost anywhere, whether it be in his own dark violence stories, in the criminal underbelly of New York, serving vigilante justice, alongside the fellow Avengers, or in the mystic realm. He has even worked alongside Doctor Strange. We could see him pop up in the MCU just about anywhere, and he could fit in. He has proven before that he truly belonged in the mysterious mystic world when he was in his detective persona, Mr. Knight. During Moon Knight Volume 5, we see him take to the streets solving mysteries and punching ghosts. Literally. Spooky. Number 5. Officially registered under the Superhuman Registration Act. During the Superhuman Registration Act and the events of Civil War, Moon Knight is being monitored by Tony Stark. Concerned about his 
insanity and considering Moon Knight unfit to be a hero, Sir considers arresting Moon Knight. Eventually, Mark reluctantly registers, listening to the voice of Khonshu, who implores him to do so. Unfortunately, he has to undergo and pass a psychiatric examination in order to be approved. Of course, the psychiatrist has no intention of passing Mark after interviewing his multiple personalities. But just as he was about to be failed, Mark uses the will of Khonshu to convince the psychiatrist to approve him. Or rather, Khonshu speaks through Mark. The psychiatrist does just that and also ends up bowing down to him. Ooh, scary stuff. Number 4 Heroic Personas with an S. You may be familiar with Moon Knight, Mark Spector's vigilante persona, but are you familiar with his other heroic personas? I'm not talking about Mr. Knight, Jake Lockley, or Steve Grant. I'm talking about Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Wolverine, among others. Mark has called on these personas when acting alone to try and bolster his courage. He even impersonated Spider-Man while getting into a fight at a strip club, much to Spider-Man's dismay. Number 3 Marks People For Their Crimes in Moon Knight Volume 3, part of the complaints made against Moon Knight while he is wrestling with the Superhuman Registration Act is that he is marking people. While we discussed the face off situation between he and Bushman on the previous Scary Facts list, this one may be even scarier. As I've said before, Moon Knight is not your typical Marvel superhero. Some may not even consider him a superhero, because he is violent, gruesome, and dark. He marks his victims with the symbol of the moon by carving it into their skin. The idea is probably to teach them a lesson, to mark them, and make them remember. However, some of his victims don't seem to learn, and so they get marked multiple times. It will be interesting to see if the MCU adopts this trait of marks. It will be interesting to see if the MCU adopts this. Ooh. Number 2 Watches You in the Dark As scary as this one sounds, it's really kind of sweet. While Moon Knight is often known as being a vigilante who gets his powers and strength from the moon, uh, that is to say he's stronger at night and is known as Khonshu, the Egyptian moon god's servant, he was also at one point a protector of travelers, specifically those of course that traveled at night. He would follow around everyday people who are on their way home from work or just on their way from one place to another. He has even guarded over those who are asleep, traveling in their dreams. Not going to lie, the idea of anyone watching me while I sleep at night creeps me out. Even if it's just Moon Knight trying to protect me. Thanks, but also kind of no thanks. Number one, he's not real. Or is he? Mark Spector has dealt with pondering about whether or not Khonshu is real when it comes to wrestling with his mental illness, making us also wonder at the same thing. But we have always known that at least he is real, right? Wrong. In Moon Knight Volume 3, the writers of the series at the time even try to mess with our reality when it comes to the character's appearance. While being shot at, his attacker demands to know in frustration why none of his bullets seem to be hitting Moon Knight, to which Mark replies, I'm not real. The way the action sequence is drawn even leaves the reader questioning. The first six issues of this Moon Knight run are also maybe some of the neatest. They are also the issues that involve his run in with ghosts, and who doesn't want to see Moon Knight question his own existence and punch ghosts? The creative team of Warren Ellis, Declan Chalvi, and Jordi Belair, who worked on these issues, did a brilliant job with the series' first arc before leaving to create the series Injection over at Image Comics, which you should also check out if you enjoy their exploration of Moon Knight's character. Plus, it's also really pretty. 